PC, accounting for your future. Hi, this is Steve from APC, and I'm the course director here at APC. So in this particular video, I'm going to give you an overview of the business valuation of what it is, why do we need to why do we need to value a business and how we're going to approach that as well. So why do we value a business? For most of our listed companies, you may have a question, why do you value it? Well, if you are going to say that well, this is a listed company on the stock exchange and it has got 300 shares in this year, for example, and each of them, the share price, the market value of the shares is to be $5 each. So that we simply take the 300 times 5 which will give us the value of the business will be $1,500. But a question for that is, if you want to buy this company for a listed company, can you only spend $1,500 to buy it? Well, maybe the answer for that is no. It's simply because maybe the shareholders of, of this listed company is willing to receive a premium from you. And what you need to do is that maybe you're going to do adjustments for those $1,500, maybe you're going to pay another $300 for those intangible uh, non current asset within the listed company as well. And maybe you can also argue that, well, is this $1,500 would relate to the true value of this listed company? Well, maybe the answer for that is no, because the market value of this $5 here may not reflect some of the information that has not been announced to the marketplace because in most of our stock exchange nowadays uh, we are in the same as John Ford, market hypothesis this means that the market value of this five dollars here will only reflect the past and the current information of the company so past information will be related to the management that we've bought into the company before and the current information will be related to the current financial figures within the financial statements of this company. But what about for the future plan the company is going to announce? For example, if the company is going to enrol in the future plan uh, of investing their money into buying the new factory, they can earn additional $3 million, $3 million of cash. And if this is the case, from the business analyst perspective, we also need to take into account those figures into valuing a business. We are not just focusing on the past and the current situation of the business, but also we need to adjust for any of this future prosperity of the business. Because we buy this company, the reason being we would like to have the future prosperity of our money coming back. Uh, rather than we just made the money away and we get nothing out of it. So that's the reason why we're going to value a business. So the business valuation, firstly, we're going to talk about the reasons why we're going to value a business. For example, we'd like to buy another company so that we're going to value it. Maybe we're going to list a company on the stock exchange and determine uh, the selling uh, the share price the company is willing to issue or we can call it the selling price or maybe you can argue that the reason why we're going to buy new business is because we're going to adjust the current share price of the company because we are in the same strong form market hypothesis nowadays we've got limited amount of information that's the reason why we're going to adjust for that but the question is how are we going to value it so we're going to talk about the ways or techniques that you can use into valuing your business. We can firstly use the asset basis to value your business. So quite interestingly, what we need to do from a shareholder's perspective is where we're going to directly take a look at the SFP. So here's the SFP for the sample company. So uh, we've got the SFP for the asset equity as well as the liability. So what we need to do from a shareholder's perspective is we're going to directly take a look at the equity figure of 67.2 and that 67.2 would be the minimum value of the complaint because it shows all of its uh, 
non-current asset, current asset minus the liability. So equity equals to asset minus the liability. So that the 67.2 shows the net figure, so net benefit that the shareholder can accept as a result of it. But this equity, 67.2, will need to be adjusted in some of the circumstances. Firstly, if you're willing to buy the company, you boss the company. If you boss the company, those intangible assets need to be realised. For example, if bought this company, its intangible asset includes the slogan. For example, the Nike company, just do it. Okay, fine. So you're going to capitalise that intangible asset related to slogan here as well. You're going to adjust the equity view, adjust the prices you're going to pay for. And maybe if the company is going to go bankruptcy, and hence, of course, the company is going to go bankruptcy, and hence, what the company should do, maybe it's going to reduce the prices that I'm going to sell for those inventories. Rather than saying at 3.8, I'm now saying at $1. So decrease by 2.8. And as a result of it, the equity figure would decrease by 2.8, which would then give us 64.4. So, what you need to do from a business analyst perspective is going to look at the SFP using the equity figure as the minimum price you're going to pay for to, to those shareholders and also you're going to adjust the figures within the SFP according to different situations. That's what I mean by asset basis. So, asset basis is where we're going to look at the net asset of the company. Net asset is what I mean by equity because the net asset is calculated using the gross asset, including a non currency as well as the current asset, minus the gross liability. So that, that gives us the net asset, we can call it the equity. The second way that we can uh, value a business is where we're going to use the dividend valuation model. And we can call it as the DVM for short. So let's see how we're going to approach this then. So dividend valuation model. It equals to the dividend that the shareholder is going to receive divided by the required return by the shareholder. We can call it as the cost of equity. So what does this actually mean is the dividend valuation model says that if we take dividend divided by the cost of equity, that would give us the price of the company. That would give us the value of the company. So let's put the figures in. So dividend, $10, cost of equity, 10%. So that the value of the company would now becomes 100. But what does that actually mean? It means that if the shareholder spent $100 in buying that company right now, if they require 10% of return in each and every year so that they can get the dividend from this company of $10 in each and every year. So that's the logic behind this pro forma. But we can also argue that this is from the perpetuity approach perspective. It's simply because if we decide to get $10 of the dividend from the company, and our required return is to be 10%. So that it can give us the price of the companies to be 100. Because we simply take 10 divided by 10% giving us 100. So that's the way that we can value the business. We can see its dividends currently in the current year. And then we divide by what you think, for example 10%. So that you, from your perspective, what is the price for the company you're going to pay for. But dividend valuation model is basically focusing on the dividend. So shareholders would prefer two things. So they would prefer dividends or and or or and capture gain. For those small shareholders in, in particular, they prefer dividends rather than the capture gain. Because they spend $100 out, they would like to receive 
they secured fixed amounts of income in each and every year from a company, like for example, ten dollars, rather than buying at one dollars and selling at ten dollars and enjoys the capital gain because that's too risky. So for most of the small shareholder, they prefer the dividend, and as a result of it, the dividend valuation model is particularly suitable for those small shareholders rather than the institutional shareholders who prefer the capital gain. So that's what I mean by dividend valuation model. But the question lies for that is that well, if the dividend grows, if the dividend grows, for example, it's not ten. But maybe it rise up to fifteen, and as a result of it, the price of the company will change as well. And of course, that's a little bit advanced. Of course, we're going to cover that in the later course. But the, uh, I mean, the simple idea behind the dividend valuation model is that it's mostly suitable for the small shareholders to value the business because they prefer the dividends. Okay. So that's the second way that we can do. And as you can see, one final point I'd like to make is that the dividend is the cash item. It's not subject to manipulation by the accounting policy. So to some extent, this approach is the cash approach. It's the cash flow approach to value the business using a perpetuity approach from the small shareholders' perspective. The third way that we can use to value a business according to your syllabus is we're going to use the P/E ratio method. So what do I mean by P/E ratio? Let me just write that here. It's the P divided by E. So P stands for the price of a company divided by the earnings. Of the company, so earnings of the company means the profit of the company. So, for example, if the earnings of the company is to be ten, but the price of the company rises to one seventy dollars per share, so as a result of it, uh, let let's just to uh, make a figure. So, one seventy relates to the total price of the company, the total value of business, and the ten relates to the profit of the tax of the company, so the P/E ratio now will become seventeen. So the higher the P/E, the better the company will be. So why this is the case? If you think about it this way, you make a profit of ten, but you can sell it at one seventy. You make ten, but you can sell it at one seventy. Very high, isn't it? So that you can sell. Seventeen times more than you actually earn, so that it can show that the company has a good future. Maybe because of the fact that the in the future that the uh, products of the company is quite popular, will be quite popular, so that the shareholder is willing to spend their money in buying new shares right now, even though they make a profit of a tax of ten dollars, but they can still spend. Uh, quite lots of money to purchase the share of the uh, of the target company. That's what we, that's what I mean by PE ratio. But the question is, how are we going to use this to estimate the price of the company? So let's just to have a look at the example. So if the target company has made a profit after tax of twenty dollars. And we are told that the target company is involved in the supermarket industry. And within the marketplace, there will be other competitors' supermarkets. The P/E ratio within the industry is to be ten. So, as a result of it, we are going to value a business. So, the value of the target company. Would be the P/E ratio within the average marketplace, for example, relates to supermarket, times the profit after tax of the target company. And in this case, the P/E ratio within the marketplace is to be ten. Profit after tax of our target company is to be twenty, so that the value of the target company is estimated to be two hundred dollars. 
That's the way we're going to use the PU ratio to do that. But the problem lies with that is that well, for the PU ratio, it can be found in the stock exchange for listed companies. But what about for the unlisted companies? So for the unlisted companies, what you need to do is to adjust for those PE ratios on your own. That is not an easy job. That's the first problem. The second problem being, this is related to the profit measurement. Profit will be subject to manipulation by the accounting policy as well as the estimate. For example, change the allowance for receivables. For example, change the way that we value the inventory will impact onto the profit figure. And hence, this will impact onto the total value of the company as well. So you have to be cautious. You have to be careful as well using this PE ratio. So what you need to do, maybe you're going to say that you're going to adjust those figures on your own according to your experience. But one of the advantages of the PE ratio methods to value a business is that it's mostly suitable for the large shareholders, for the institutional shareholders. It's simply because they prefer the capital gain rather than just a single dividend. So that, of course, the PE ratio is suitable for those large shareholders. So those are the three ways that we can value a business. Of course, in the later papers, there will be a lot more ways to value a business as well, beyond those three. But anyway, that's just the introduction of the business valuation in this particular section. So why do we value a business? Maybe we're going to buy it, the other company. Maybe we're going to adjust the information that is currently exists in the marketplace. So that's the business valuation. So thank you. APC, accounting for your future.